we're winning. Um, 30 seconds as well. One of the reasons we do these live streams is so that we can uh, take content from it and then put it elsewhere in the platforms that we use. Uh, yeah, so it's all exciting. Oh, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, Hey, we are live. Look at that posh title. Oh, I don't know if people saw that. The fit to submit title. Um, I've just realized though, does that mean that we're not doing the topic of the week? Well, we have a title of our live stream that we try and pull everything together on a theme, don't we? And then topic of the week within that. If you've got the topic of the week, I want, thingy yeah, I ready, want then I think you should still use it. Yes, quite right. Oh, good. I'm pleased with that. I'm going to take it away now. There. Oh, click the buttons. Hello, Naomi. How are you doing? Hello. I'm very well. Thank you. How are you, Tim? I'm good. Every time I go live, I've noticed that my uh, my eyes start tearing, and I don't know why. It's really oh, weird. Hmm. That is a bit weird. Psychological response. Hmm. Uh, I haven't got the Word document up, I've just realised. So if you tell us what we're going to do today. Um, well, well, we're not going to talk about our job titles. That's very clear in our uh, Word document. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we are talking this week about making your assignment fit to submit. Yes. Um, and that is going to, we're going to cover, we're going to look at citing and referencing. Um, just in a in a broad sense um, and also proofreading those last final checks um that we are that, that you do before you submit an assignment so we can talk about those in a bit tim before I, oh you're in the document i can see you have arrived yes. in the document you're going to talk about some library news and some did you know oh yes that's really good so this is a new section i was going to make a uh, slide for this and i didn't so uh, i have to apologize for that because i didn't know what the slides should say but we are going to talk about some of the library news. Alex challenged me to do this in two minutes. I could do it in 10 seconds. Uh, but basically what we are going to talk about is three things that we wanted to highlight. One is the booking system. And I need to find my mouse. Oh, I need to click on a button. Yes. So we can now show you. We have been having this for ages. Uh, but you can book your visit. So that's really important. We would like you to book your visit when you come to the library. We've done this since the start of the year. It still seems that some people don't really know about it. So we've decided to highlight it a bit more and say, book your visit. We are open for business, just book a place and you come along. Then the other thing I want to talk about was that the uh, coming period, we will reduce our opening hours a little bit, mainly because um, of all sorts of different things, but the opening hours have changed a bit. Go and have a look on the website and see what the opening hours are currently. You'll be pleased to know that uh, Kettleston Road will be open all the way up to Christmas and then between Christmas and New Year. For the other sides, it's slightly more complicated, so have a look at that. And then the final thing I want to highlight in our new section is the PALS scheme. Uh, we've launched that together with the Union of Students, or actually the Union of Students has launched it this year. And it's aimed at first year students. You can get some really good advice from the PALS scheme. So go and have a look at that. You probably have been told about it. You might have lost interest or forgot about it or whatever it is. Go and have a look at the PAL scheme. It'll be really good. Shall we good. say what PAL stands for? It's, it's PALS, isn't it? So don't you do things like going shopping together and stuff like that? No, Tim. It is the Peer Assisted Learning Scheme. Ah, that's useful. That actually sounds <laughs> useful. Yeah. So the Peer Assisted Learning Scheme. Yes, you're absolutely right, Naomi. Was that two minutes? Yes. I I was not timing. I was. Um, so <laughs> I think that's done. And then we are going to talk about... Ooh, we're going to the topic of the week, aren't we? Yes. Are yes. You going, I, I can't see anything. I just like to say to people, I can't see anything. So I can't see what Tim is putting on the screen for everyone to see. I can't see Tim this week either um, because of a lack of USB ports. Um, yes. So I feel like I'm just talking into the... Of into, into the void but anyway i'm going to carry on um yes so have you done what you need to do with your topic of the week yes yes, yes. we had the yes. stamp the right. stamp of approval yes that's all right then yeah. so we're like i said just now we're taking fit to submit um as the theme of the live stream and we're going to look at these two topics citing and referencing and proofreading and i want to just just explain why we picked those why we why we chose those and it was because we have been 
it's based on the questions that we are getting in in the library so as a library we get lots of questions asked of us by lots of students on lots of different topics um, and what we have been getting questions about this week has been questions about citing and referencing and questions about proofreading so that's what we're talking about this in this live stream so if there are any questions that you guys want us to answer in our live streams then do let us know send us an email use the live chat put a comment on youtube um, just let us know because we these live streams are designed to be responsive that's yes. one of the reasons we're live yes little jazz hands there um is to be responsive to what what you as students want us to talk about so do let us know because we are we are doing our best to um to, to, to cover what 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 you want us to cover and like so this week the questions the library's been getting have been definitely citing and referencing and proofreading so that's what we're going to talk about it's because it's assessment season isn't it yes yeah. yes um yes yeah. so hopefully that means that everybody is is very um they're on their essays they've got their first draft or their second draft or their third draft and they're thinking oh i just need to finish off my references or oh i just need to proof th read this now so yeah it's a good thing i think it's a good thing and good i'm going to talk first about citing and referencing i'm going to do a another fancy transition oh wow are you putting my slides up yeah i'm missing the button though so it's oh there we go yes how do i reference it says now yes so i'm not what I so again, like I said, I went and I looked at what people were asking us about, and a lot of the referencing questions that we had in could come under one general theme. So I thought we might even do a little series of this if we get carried away. How do I reference dot dot dot? And then Tim, next slide, please. This document. This document I found on the internet, and that sums up a lot of the questions we've been getting. So we've had students who have found things on the internet of various types, and they're asking us how to reference them. So I'm not going to go into specifics talking now because um, everything is so different and so unique that if, if I went into specifics on, on three or four things, it would help you for those three or four things and then, and then not for the next thing you found on the internet. But I'm going to talk about some general things, some general themes, and just give some hints and tips, basically. Um, so if we go to the next slide, Tim, one of the things we get asked about a lot is referencing legislation. Um, so that is widely available on the internet. I mean, you can you can access you can access all the manner of um, UK legislation, as you can see from this slide. Legislation.gov.uk um, lets you search it, and so it's right right there on the internet. Um, and we get questions about how to reference that. Now, with everything that we reference, we say go and look at Cite Them Right. Um, and the key thing with Cite Them Right is that it tells you how to reference all sorts of things, but you need to know what it is that you're trying to reference when you go away to look at Cite Them Right, if that makes sense. So having an understanding of what you're trying to reference is really, really vital. And it's vital for two reasons. The first reason is if you're going to reference it properly, you need to be able to look in Cite Them Right to look up the specific thing that you're trying to reference. So you need to know what it is before you reference it. The second reason that you need to understand what it is you're trying to reference is because you need to be thinking to yourself as well, do I want to be including this into my assignment is this appropriate to use in my assignment and you can't make that decision unless you know what indeed it is we have lots of um, support from our academic librarians on this topic on should i include this in my assignment and um, most recently they ran a workshop at study fest i think tim you're going to talk about study fest later aren't you how to access those recordings back but yes, if you're interested yeah. in that at all, in thinking about whether you should be um, using resources in your assignment, then go and check out the relevant um, workshop that, that was run in Study Fest because the recording is live now. You can get onto it until just until Christmas, um, 18th of December, I think we said, didn't we? Um, they're going to be live for. So go and take a look at that because that was a really great session. Um, but so that to one side. Let's assume that you've thought about it and thought, yes, I do want to include this in my assignment. You need to know what it is so that you can reference it properly. And one, the key message I want to give in this in this segment is that there is lots of information out there to help you understand what you're looking at as well. So to reference legislation, you um, might need to talk about um, chapter numbers, for example. Um, and if you don't know what those are, there are ways that you can find out, essentially. So this page that I've screenshotted here on this slide, legislation.gov.uk, 
as you can see, there's a, there's tabs along the top. That's my smoke alarm going off. You may or may not be able to hear that. Um, my husband is cooking. <laughs> yes, that's the excuse um, I always have. Well, I'm clearly not cooking because I am <laughs> <laughs> I am here live streaming to the internet. You are indeed, um, yes. So tabs along the top, you've got home so you can search for your legislation, but that next tab is understanding legislation. Loads of useful information here. And if you can see this menu on the left hand side, the second option down is citation and numbering. There is information right alongside that legislation, um, that UK legislation, information about the citation and about the numbering system. I couldn't show you in the same screenshot what the blurb looks like because it was just further down the page and then I missed the menu out of my screenshot. It was causing me issues earlier. But if you go to legislation.gov.uk, find this bit and click on citation and numbering, you will get information about the citations, the numbering systems. So it's always worth doing a search on the internet, doing just a little bit of further exploration if you're not sure what it is that you're seeing or what Cite Them Right is asking you to do. Because Cite Them Right will say with legislation, you need to use, include the chapter number. And that citation numbering information on legislation.gov.uk will explain what that is. Mm -hmm. So it's always worth just going that little step further to understand what it is you're looking at before you think to yourself, oh no, I can't reference this. You can do it, the information is there. Can I? I'm just going to ask a question. Yes, sorry. Yes. Um, one of the questions I get a lot is like, um, what what certain law is called? So let's say the Mental Health Act. How would you find that on the uh, internet? Are you asking me how I would find it? Mm. Would you go to this website for that sort of stuff? I would probably put it into a major search engine. Um, starts with G and ends in Google. Um, <laughs> And type in the mental All health. All the search, search engines are available. Other search engines are available. One starts with G and ends in Duck, believe it or not, because it's called Go Go Duck. Uh -huh. It's called, isn't it called Duck Duck Go? Oh yeah, it is. Ah, this week's sponsor. <laughs> we should make one called Go Go Duck. <laughs> we should. It would be brilliant. It's a Derbyshire search engine. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll go to the next slide before we get out of hand. Yes, yeah, so that was legislation. The next slide I wanted to talk about was um, command papers, so green and white papers. Again, this is coming directly off the questions that we've been asked um, here at the library. So again, li literally, I used a search engine that I will not name, and I typed in, what are command papers? And I got to this website, um, Parliament website, um, about how publications government um, was the, 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 the little um, chain that went there. You can see the, the web address that I took this screenshot from, but literally the information is here and that's all I did. I went in onto my search engine and put what are command papers and this information came up. So again, Cite Them Right will tell you for green and white papers, you need to be using the command number. And if you can see at the bottom of this screen, there is CM5860. That's a command number that I took from a green paper. Um, but here we've got the information about command numbers. Um, so it tells us actually why they're called command papers. It's because um, they say on them presented to Parliament by the Secretary of State for blah, 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 by command of Her Majesty. Um, and they all start with CM and then a number. So this paper that I that I took it from is CM for command 5860. So again, if Cite Them Right is saying to you, you need to include the command number, and you don't know what the command number is, take that next step and go and look, because this information is here, like I say. And on this, on this page that I put the link to, there were lots of information about what a green paper is, what a white paper is, um, all this information that is useful to you to work out what it is you are looking at. Yeah. Because like I say, that's the key when referencing, that's the key when thinking about whether you should be including this in your assignment or not. I'm just going to switch the camera real quick now before you carry on with the next slide. Um, okay. I think I never really realized how much information the government's actually put online. Um, and I think it is actually organized in a really sensible manner, which surprised me. <laughs> um, as a Dutchman coming to Britain, I was like, hey, wait. Uh, anyway, let's not go down that path. But you can find out loads about how the government works and what the government does 
by going online. Their websites, their Gov UK websites, tend to be really, really good and well organized. So it's always worth having a look at that um, because there's so much information available as well. You know, there's like literally endless reams and reams of information. Uh, and I, I found it rather interesting going down that rabbit hole uh, some time ago. Yes, and this is, of course, one of the reasons why we get so many questions about referencing things found on the internet. It's because there's a lot on the internet. Um, the inter this is this is going to be a stupid statement of the live stream. The internet is really big. There's a lot of information there. There's shall a lot I, on there. Shall I do the statistics? No, we're not going to bother with that. Anyway, we're no. going back to uh, site and write slides. Yeah. Yes, yes. So here I've taken a screenshot from Cite Them Right. Um, you can see the menu along the top. We've got home basics, books, journals. I focused on digital and internet, but if we just go um, a bit further along, you will see there is legal, there's gov and EU there. So all that information about referencing legislation, government papers, all that is on those um, that gov and EU tab. But we've also got this digital and internet tab and I've put the menu for Harvard up um, Harvard referencing, as you can see, Sight Them Right covers all these different referencing stars. We've got APA 7th, 6th, Chicago, IEEE, all those ones there, Escola. Um, but for Harvard, there's all these different options. And so if you are looking at a web page, for example, you can see we've got web pages with individual authors, web pages with organizations as authors, web pages with no authors, web pages with no authors or titles. So we often get questions that will say, I am trying to reference this web page, who is the author? So first have a look, see if there is a named person as an individual author. Can you see a name of someone who's written what you're reading? If not, then move on to the organization. Can you see an organization who has produced this? So um, let's take the BBC website, for example. You will often find, say, a BBC news article will have um, the name of the journalist that's written it. If you've not got one of those, then you would use BBC as the organization. But if you can't find either of those, then you've got an option for web pages with no authors. So that option is there. And um, if you can't find an author for your web page, don't worry about, I don't know, I don't using some kind of high tech digital sleuthing to find the author of a website. Um, if there isn't an author there, then just reference it as being a web page with no author. Um, and there's also options for no authors or titles, web pages with no dates. Um, and also you will see there's a heading down at the bottom there that says about referencing the internet. So if you want to read further about referencing the internet, go on to cite them right. There's all that broad range of information there. So summing up what I've said so far, find out, work out in your own mind so you are clear yourself what it is you are trying to reference. What is this thing that you're looking at that you found on the internet? You may have found it through any variety of means, but once you found it, you need to work out what it is you're looking at. Then go to Cite Them Right and Cite Them Right will tell you how to reference whatever it is you're looking at. If you can't find it on the menus, there's a search box in the top right hand corner where you can search for things. So if you were to put green paper into that search box, it would come up. The final thing I want to talk to you about is, again, it sits on this menu from Sight Them Right, um, and it's talking about repositories, digital repositories. And can we go on to the next slide, please, Tim? Boom. So I want to talk about institutional repositories. This is the institutional repository from the University of Chester. Um, you can see the web address in the screenshot that I've put on. And most universities in the UK have institutional repositories. Lots and lots of places across the world have institutional repositories. We have one here at the University of Derby. Our one is called Eudora. Um, I think the Chester one was called Chester Rep. Um, and I want, but I picked this, this screenshot in particular to show you because I went through the browse menu um, and I, you can see I was browsing the publications put forward by the Faculty of Arts and Media, Art and Design. And then they've got two options. They can, you can browse the Art and Design section or Art and Design Unpublished. And this is what I wanted to highlight with institutional repositories. What they are is they are places where people associated with, a, with an institution, a university in this case, people associated with the university have written something. They've written something, they might have published it in a journal, they might have, um, it might be a book chapter, whatever. And then they, in addition to it being published in that journal, it has been uploaded into their repository. So 
a lot of this comes under um, open access, which means that you can access it without a login, without paying, without any of those things. So if you are studying at the University of Derby, you have your login details and you could access all of the resources that, that, um, that the library subscribes to. If you don't have a login for any university, you could still come onto an institutional repository and find articles, find information. So like I say, the University of Derby has one, we have Eudora, lots and lots of other places do as well. So if you're searching in Google Scholar, for example, you may well find results coming up that are coming from these institutional repositories. But you still need to be doing this thinking about what it is that you are, what that you found, and whether or not you're going to include it in your assignment. So the reason I wanted to highlight this screenshot in particular is because we have this section for unpublished um, things. Now, I'm not saying don't use anything that's that's not been published, but you need to be thinking about, is this meeting my requirements for what I'm going to include in my assignment? And um, if it's not been published, it's not probably not been peer reviewed. So a lot of journal articles will go through a peer review process before they get into a journal. Other people in the field will read them and they will make comments and they will check that it's all a OK. Um, if it's not gone through that peer reviewed, if it's not been published, it may well not have gone through that peer review process. So it comes back again. Think about what it is that you are reading and make those decisions. Do I am I going to include it in my assignment? And like I say, check out all the information from our academic librarians about that. Um, and then now I know what it is. I'm going to go to site write them right and find out how to reference it. Yeah. So um, thing to add, Tim. Yeah. So one of the things I got asked uh, yesterday, is it Wednesday today? I can't remember with all this lockdown stuff. Um, but yeah, yesterday a student asked me about uh, how do I know whether this article was peer reviewed? Um, and the answer to that is find out where it was published. So what was the original publication site? Was it published in a journal article? If it was published in a journal article as an article, so not an opinion piece or something like that. If it was published in a journal article, uh, in a journal as an article, and that journal states that it does peer review for its publication, you can work on the assumption that it's been peer reviewed. That sounds really complicated. It's not that difficult actually, because all you need to do really is go to our, um, what's it called again, journal finder, e-journal finder. And when you go there, you find the journal that the article was published in. And you can then usually also get access to the um, instructions for publication. So there's a, something there that will say that this uh, uh, journal contains peer reviewed articles. And that is a really good way of finding out. So yeah. if you're not sure whether it's peer reviewed, go to the source of publication. It's another one of these things that that one step is actually doing multiple things, because if you are referencing something in an institutional repository like this, then the 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 ideal reference is the publication that it was published in. Yeah. So yeah. if it was published in a journal, reference that journal. And this is what Cite Them Right will tell you if you go and look, reference that journal and the article within the journal. You may have read it through the repository, but reference the journal that it was published in. Yeah. And there's also then information about um, referencing it if it's only in the repository and not in a journal. But that same point applies. You need to be going back and finding what is this, where is it from, who's written it, why have they written it, all those questions that um, that you're considering. And that will help you both in your, in your deciding whether or not to include it, but also in your working out how to reference it. Yeah. I'm trying to find Eudora and I can't find it. I will find it because I've worked on it, so I should know where it is. See, Oop. no, I can't find it. Uh, we'll have to look for Eudora. Have Ooh. you gone to a well-known search engine and typed in Eudora? I'm trying that now. Oh, look, yes. Oh, oh, I'm going to type it in the chat. Um, Derby Open Repository. No wonder I couldn't remember it to be honest. Uh, dot com. Boom. That's it. I was looking for it in the Derby uh, domain, but clearly it's not there. But the you know is great. Computers just told me that my internet connection is unstable. I'm just going to put that out there in case. Oh I just... dear. Well, shall I take over for a few minutes and talk yes, about well, the I next Yes, well, I was finished topic? now. Yes, uh, and when you go, we always have unexpected Naomi. <laughs> um. Anyway, so um. I'm going to talk to you about proofreading. One of the things that we get asked a lot um, is, does the library have a service that can help me proofread? Can you help me proofread my work? 
Uh, I would like this to be proofread by someone who knows what they're talking about. Unfortunately, the answer to all of that is no, we don't do proofreading for the very simple reason that there's 16 and a half thousand full time students. Can you imagine the work if we started offering proofreading services? Um, so this three, we're actually going to talk about proofreading uh, because proofreading is part of the making your work fit to submit. And we're going to discuss that in some detail. But I just want to highlight that, um, yes, the library just does not do proofreading. It wouldn't be fair. We couldn't do it for everybody. And not only that, uh, proofreading is a really important part of your um, skill set. So it's something that you need to learn to do anyway. Um, when you work for an employer somewhere, you wouldn't actually ask uh, ask a colleague to proofread your work. Although you might do, but you know, a lot of the time you would have to proofread yourself. So we don't do proofreading at the library. Uh, you can ask, the answer will be no. What we do do is that we will help you with short statements, with uh, references, things that you find a bit difficult. You can always contact the library. Uh, you could just email us at library at uk. You can go to the live chat, which I will show you. I seem to have conveniently moved the particular page I was going to show you here. Uh, but yes, I can show you the live chat as well. So when you go to libguides.david.ac.uk, you will find a little green box at the bottom and you can answer, ask your question there. And if the people who are answering the chat don't know the answer, then that's not really a problem because you know they will send it on to someone who will know the answer. So do use that. We are there for you. We do want to help you. But reading all your work, you know, it's, it's just not feasible. We don't want to do that. And also it impedes your academic performance if we do that. So that's just not possible. The only exception, and even then it's not true proofreading to this, is that if you have a uh, learning disability of any type, for example, dyslexia, and you have a statement, and that statement states that you have a right to specialist support, then you will be entitled to use our specialist tutors and the wellbeing team, wellbeing at diabetes.uk. The wellbeing team will help you identify what you need, what that looks like, all the support that you need, you will get through them. So that's not a library function. We don't offer that in the library. To do that, you will have to go and visit your wellbeing advisor. And one way of getting in touch with your wellbeing team is by talking to your college advisors in the student center. So no, we do not do proofreading. But we do have a lot of material available. You can see I'm looking to my left now because I'm reading the list. We have an academic writing lib guide, so I'm going to show you that now. So again, this is libguides.dabi.ac.uk. And if you go to the skills guides and then academic writing, you'll find our academic writing uh, skills guide. Loads of information that will help you improve your writing, but also we have a section on proofreading. We also have available uh, part of the uh, podcast series that we've done uh, referencing and proofreading. So you can have a look at that or listen to that more, more like. Uh, we have a skill short that you can see here with lovely Alex. And Alex talks about proofreading in that. Alex also does a workshop on proofreading. And I'm just going to uh, show you how you would find that. So currently there isn't one planned, but we are planning to do one January, February, I think. If you go to lipcal.dabi.ace.uk, you can search for event, you type in proofreading, and if you proofread that, then you know that that was spelled wrong. You type in proofreading, and you can see that today's um, live stream pops up uh, because we're talking about proofreading. So the workshops will show up in there. And then uh, I'm going to talk about proofreading in a bit more detail in about 15 minutes, just so that we can actually give you tips and tricks here in the stream. So um, I think we have quite a lot of proofreading uh, material available. You need to learn to do the proofreading because it's skill that you need uh, is the main message. I'm just highlighting that we would love it if you liked and subscribed to the channel. It really helps us out. In the last week with StudyFest, we've gained about 50 followers, I think, 40, 50. We have a goal now. We have a target set and... Um, my team is very excited about this target. I'm popping Naomi back on camera so she can show her excitement. I'm full of excitement. <laughs> I love targets. I love Yay. YouTube analytics. They just all they just all really speak to what motivates me. Yes. 
key performance indicators. Um, so yeah, what we're trying to do is get 500 subscribers before the end of the year. And Alex will type if he's still here, because I just saw loads of messages come into the chat from Derby Uni Library. Sort of suggest that Alex had an internet problem. Uh, but Alex will say that the end of the academic year is the end of the year. And he's right, because I've told him that. So that has to be right. Is that correct, uh, Naomi? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I lost your train of thought ever so slightly there. Oh, I was you? wondering if it was raining with Alex, and then I was wondering if that was linked to my internet problem. So maybe the internet, large as it is, had a little wobble. It might. It's. it's oh, no, it's not raining, dear. That's the window cleaners. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to confuse the two, especially if you're not expecting the window cleaners. <laughs> exactly, yes. Ah, um, right, so... Um, oh, my... My script is gone now. I need to find out what we're doing next now. Um, so we were going to talk about the the Study Fest LibGuide that is available um, on the interwebs mm -hmm. and all the recordings thereon. Yes. The Study Fest LibGuide. You want me to go to the browser again now, don't you? Well, shall I talk a little bit about the Study Fest LibGuide whilst you go and find it? No, you know what we're going no? to do. I've got it ready anyway. Don't worry about it. We're going to talk about Study Fest just for a brief moment. Is that a good idea? Yes. Yeah, because That's I'm actually, idea. I'm really, really pleased with how it's all gone. Um, I viewed back several sessions, not all of them, I didn't have time. But my word, what an enormous collection and abundance of knowledge that you could actually partake in. You know, I, I genuinely believe it was a really good event. What do you think, Naomi? Yeah, absolutely. We had such a range of um, really high quality workshops on on so many different topics. We had colleagues from around the university came and helped us out and ran sessions. Um, so we really did cover an awful, awful lot in that week. And if um, you did want a broad overview of things to enhance your studying, that is definitely the place to go and look. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what was your favourite session? Now I'm putting you on the spot. The favourite session that I went to? probably shouldn't say my own should i no i don't think i don't you, don't you don't enjoy your own running your own ones in the same way as um i thought our live stream was fun though yeah all the live streams are always fun no i enjoyed um i went to one of the ones on um digital literacy the basics of design and that was really really interesting things that i just had no idea existed like websites that let you pick a lovely color scheme they'll mm. find colors that comp a website that just finds colors that complement each other so yeah. you can pick one color and it will find you other colors that complement it. I mean, that's just amazing. Or fonts that complement each other. You can pick one font and it will find you other fonts that go well with it. Yeah, like Really, design really and... useful things that yeah. just take the designy element out of it. Does that make sense? Because yeah. I would have no idea what font went with another font. Um, but there's a website that can tell me. As we've said before, the internet got loads of stuff on it <laughs> it has got loads of stuff on it this is the um, summary of this live stream Naomi is, yeah. baffles at how large the internet is <laughs> use go go duck today's sponsor um <laughs> the uh the one that i really liked was the office 365 one i'm always amazed at how much things you can do with office 365 it's like it's like an endless source of stuff that i didn't know you know let's put it this way i grew up when um it wasn't even called Office, I think. It was MS Works or whatever it was called in the beginning. Mm. So you had a word processor that basically, you know, Notepad these days is more powerful than that word processor. And it took ages to get anything done. And, you know, you always yeah. used to lose your work because it didn't save properly on a floppy or whatever it was. These days, it's all, you know, it's on the interwebs. We keep talking about the internet. And it just works. And there's so many things you can do with yeah. it. It's incredible. It's really cool. My sister and I used to play on our computer and literally it would just be typing letters and we would type the letters to make different patterns on that known, like say notepad type thing. And you'd just make pictures. We'd make pictures using the different letters and the symbols. There's a word for that. For fun. Do you know what that's called? It still exists. What is it called? It's called ASCII ad, A-S-C-I-I. -I. And ASCII oh. is the standard for symbols i can't remember i used to know what the acronym stood for uh yeah. look it up on go go duck uh <laughs> but yeah it's uh basically ascii is um 
what we use for Western letters, so the Latin fonts, uh-huh. if you like, and then all the associated gubbins, your semicolons, your hyphens, everything else fits into that uh, standard. Um, so yeah, have a look. But you can make entire art works mm. doing that. I remember. I'm not saying that we ever did anything that was that spectacular. No, you did. You just didn't realize it. Um, <laughs> there was a time also way in the past, well before Alex was born. Alex is not with us today, by the way. Well, he is in in uh, person in the background, but he's substitute again. Uh, but before Alex was born, you used to download uh, stuff from the internet, not always legal. Um, and they would come with ASCII art that was really cool because they had like uh, skulls that would spin round. And oh yes, you're taking me back on a. It was really good. It was exciting. Yeah, the fact that you could make that just with letters and, and symbols was really cool. And, of course, the best game ever made, Dwarf Fortress. I'm geeking out now, aren't I? We're losing the audience. Let's go on to the next topic. Woo, uh, Have you pulled guide. up the study fest lib guide yet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember, yes. Well done, Naomi. Um, so this is the uh, library website. Um, I'm just showing you from here because it's the easiest way to get to where we want to be. So the library website, you scroll down, you go to find subject information, and then uh, you get the libguides. So this is the page, whenever I refer to libguides, this is the page I'm talking about. And then you click on skills guides, which is the section that uh, our team look after. And then you can click on study fest 2020, sponsored by GoGoDuck. Um, and on here, you see this lovely page. Uh, I just want to shout out Barbara, uh, who's designed these wonderful logos. I think they are really, really nice. They really uh, catch what we did on uh, the whole week, basically. And you can then click on one of these teams. So we've got the Studying Online team, the Wellbeing, Library Day, Fundamental Skills, and the Careers and Change. And if you click on, for example, Fundamental Skills, you'll find the digital literacy session that Naomi was talking about before. Which one did you go to, Naomi? The if, uh, storytelling one or the design to support? I went to basics of design. I want to watch back the storytelling one. I couldn't make it. Yeah, I want, that's that on my on my to-do list as well. And remember, you can see them back until the 18th of December. We've still got three weeks, roughly. Can you pull up the library day page and just show where the um, session is about evaluating resources? Yes, we, we call it there. evaluating your sources, not resources. Ah, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that's there. So uh, again, the uh, library day, Wednesday was the library day. Evaluating your sources. When you want to see that, you can click on view the recording through this link. And I'm going to do that now without blowing anything up. It just takes you to collaborate. And then you can see the recording of that session. You can uh, pause it. You can watch it in your own time. If the kids are moaning about baubles in the tree falling down or the cat weeing on the carpet, don't worry about it. You can pause it and continue watching it as you go along. So that's really useful. Um, and like I said, they, they will be available till the 18th of December. So do have a look. There's so many good things there. Um, yeah, I think genuinely brilliant. Uh, you know, from the University of Derby to you, from the library to you, uh, from all our lovely colleagues in well-being, Intel, which is technology enhanced learning, ITS, uh, careers, chaplaincy, uh, chaplaincy uh, the Eng- English Centre, uh, the Maths Hub. And the Hub. aforementioned peer assisted learning leaders. Yes, the Union of Students, yes. Those sessions weren't recorded just because of the nature of the sessions. It's 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 peer support. It's um it's designed to be um open and let people ask questions and things. But if you are interested in that support, like Tim said before, and you're a first year student, then go and check out the Union of Students website about how to get in touch with your pal. Yeah. And the Union of Students have loads of support available, generally anyway. So do make use of them. Um, I know that not all students always know about what they do, uh, but they are, you know, they're more than just uh, going out for the night fun or playing sports. They do lots of different things. So do use them. That's what they're there for. Excellent. Right. I'm just looking at the plan, Tim. This is the kind of thing that Alex thinks about beforehand, and he was talking to us already about flow and things, wasn't he? But I was wondering if I should do the grammar topic of the week next because then it breaks up your talking. I can actually have a bit of a break and drink water then. That's a good idea. Shall I talk? I'll do that then. So I don't, I don't know if you want to use any snazzy 
um, animations or Ooh. anything. But oh, yes, yes, yes. Let's do it. Grammar topic. topic of the week. Yep. Oh, let me get it ready. I don't know where it's gone. It might go oh, all no. wrong. No, it's there. Oh, love your library. Oh, grammar topic of the week. Awesome. With all the so, audio with it. Oh. This week, I am going to talk about homophones and malapropisms. So this came again. I can't say this came directly from a student question. This came from a staff conversation between myself, Alex, and Tim, um, that we had over several workshops. And it was if if anyone, if our really dedicated super fan was attending everything we did, they'd have got the whole conversation about Segway, um, because. Alex and Tim use the word segue a lot. They talk about seg having a segue from one part of a conversation to another, or as indeed our live streams, a segue from one part of a live stream to another. And I was literally picturing us on one of those little bike things with the wheels that you stand on and zoom around. And I was picturing us zooming from one point to another. And I thought that's what they were talking about. But it turns out that is a completely different word. So the word that Alex and Tim were using, segue, is spelt S-E-G-U-E, I think. Um, the thing I was picturing is a brand, a trademark brand name, and is um, spelt S-E-G-W-A-Y. Have you so, ever, I'm interrupting you, apologies. Have you ever used the segue? No, I don't dare. I had one I'm sure in, I'd uh, fall off. I had one in Riga, you know, one of those tours where you follow someone. Oh, good grief. Yeah. That sounds highly stressful. Well, the fun thing was we were with, like, uh, Americans from a cruise ship that were at least 70 years old. And the guy who was guiding us, he was a lovely chap, but he made us go forward at, like, two kilometers an hour, which is actually more difficult than just going full throttle. So I ended up riding circles around this group to just stay, you know, upright. Uh -huh. Anyway, apologies for that intervention. I thought it was useful information. <laughs> Very useful. So that segue and segue in those two forms, that is a homophone. It is they are words that sound the same when you say them, but they are spelt differently and they mean different things. So this is going to tie in wonderfully with proofreading and I'll get on to that in a second. Malapropisms are words that sound similar and are, can be easily confused with each other. Um, so I was talking about institutional repositories earlier, the malapropism that my husband suggested to me when I was talking about this. In fact, I, I, I tell a lie. That was a blatant misrepresentation of what happened. The malapropism that my husband suggested to me when he said, you should talk about malapropisms. And I said, what's a malapropism? Um, was repository and suppository. They are very different things. Um, a repository is a very different thing to a suppository. They sound similar. They're easy to get confused. So words that, um, that sound exactly the same and are easy to get confused and words that sound similar and are easy to get confused can really trip you up when you are writing your assignments. And they are things that you will need to look out for when you are proofreading because they are all genuine valid words. So a spell check on your um on the afford well we're pulling see this is pulling into care all the different ties your spell check on microsoft word 365 um will not highlight them because they're real words so if i used maybe not segue maybe it would pull up pick up segue but anyway it's it's a it's a legitimate word it's just being used incorrectly so you need to be concentrating and thinking about these things as you proofread and not rely just on a spell checker to pull everything up. That is my grammar topic of the week. Although it might be a malapropism. No, that no, if it's not a real word, it's not, no. no. It's a word that sounds the same, but it's a completely different word. So segue and segue, they sound the same, but they're completely different words. They're spelt differently and they are used differently. Is a word that sounds similar, so it doesn't sound exactly the same, but it sounds similar enough that you can easily confuse them.
Yes. Yes, just like that. One that comes, one that I see a lot. Um, I, so I wouldn't necessarily see this in academic work. Work, I don't think, but one that I see a lot on social media. Um, so seeing and seen. So people might instead of write seeing as, they put seen as. Two very different words sound similar. It's been and being exactly. Um, I have. I you know. The, yeah. It. it it's, it's those kinds of words that, that sometimes they're just easier to type they're um they're they're easier to say in your sentence and in social media it doesn't matter i don't mind in your instagram posts well from an academic point of view i suppose it depends your well no nah, see I, we might have to save this for a different discussion but particularly in your academic work make sure that you're not um doing things like say like using seen instead of seeing or being instead of being um because that will like say a spell check won't pull those things up oh alex has told me some time ago five minutes ago that we've lost audio for tim I don't know how long, how long have I been talking for without Tim being able to be heard? Oh dear, and poor Alex. Oh I just heard my so Alex word. is communicating oh. with us. I'm going to keep on talking now, just in case you can't hear, hear Tim. You Alex can hear is me communicating now. You can by hear Teams. Me now. And bless him, he's been typing in capital letters on multiple messages. <laughs> we can't hear Tim. And I'm Tim muted. and I, because Tim and I have been talking, couldn't hear. Oh, that was a bit no. of a shame. We that do must always have say, quite odd. yeah, we do always say, what can go wrong in the live stream? Me clicking a mute button and then forgetting that I've clicked it is one of and those five things. Five whole minutes. Oh, well, at least you've been going on about a malapropisms. Um, yeah. Yes. I wonder how odd my half that conversation started. Alex is even trying to ring me, but he can't because I'm on Do Not Disturb on Teams. Alex, bless him, has tried every method that he had available to him to get in touch with us there. He should have sent me a text message, but my phone is on Do Not Disturb as well, so that doesn't work. Yeah, my phone. I turned my sound off on my phone yeah. just before I started. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Anyway. Oh, well, it and happens. It, yes. Tim, do you want to talk about your proofreading tips now? Because we've no, got... I'm so disappointed. We've lost, like, a whole few as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, better than losing half of you, I would exactly. say. Exactly. The first thing I noticed was Alex has entered our Zoom call. He's now left again, but yeah. Oh, oh, really? Dear. Alex really was trying to. And I didn't it have was. Zoom up because I can't see Tim. So what would be the point? I know. Right, oh. Tim, talk about proofreading tips yes. before all the other viewers leave. Let's recover from this in a swift and sensible uh, manner. So, haha, proofreading. Yay. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, proofreading <laughs> uh, because proofreading is actually really important. Um, and like I said earlier, it's a skill that you, well, you might not have heard it. Who knows? But proofreading is a skill that you need to uh, have for yourself that you need to make sure you adopt um, and apply whenever you can. So proofreading, let's talk about some of the things that you need to check when you are proofreading. The first one sounds simple, but spelling, punctuation and grammar have to be correct. If a piece is badly written and the... Um, you know, you've got basic mistakes like uh, Neil was just talking about being, being, seen, seeing. Uh, there's quite a lot of those. They really drag a piece of work down. So make sure that you check that stuff and don't rely on the spell checker because the spell checker will actually not pick up if you use been instead of being. Um, you also need to check whether your work's in the word count. And actually, this was quite a fun one. I got a question about this the other day. Uh, because um, basically someone asked uh, what is the word count and well I tried to explain it um, but then it turned out that the lecturer had a different idea about the word count the way that I explain word count what is counted in the word count is you have the first sentence uh, of your introduction and the last sentence of your conclusion everything in between counts as word count so make sure that you count that when you put some work in uh, and that does include things like tables, figures. Uh, I once had someone argue that citations, in-text citations, should not be in the word count 
absolutely they should because uh, you know they are part of the word count. You need to make sure that you're answering the question, and this is so important. Um, basically, if you are answering a question, your assignment needs to make sure it reaches that you know that target. If you like, you need to make sure that you answer the question because if you don't answer the question, you are going to be really, really struggling getting the right uh, marks, basically. And then the next one I'm going to go into a bit more detail, but containing the variety of, of sources is very important. Also check whether your assignment follows a logical structure. And what a logical structure basically means that if someone who doesn't know your work reads it, they understand where you're going with something. So don't make it too uh, fuzzy and complicated. Just keep it simple and logical and try and work on that as well. Proofreading your references is so important. Make sure you use all the things that we talked about earlier. Cite and write. Uh, just double check your references. I genuinely, personally, don't believe that you should be marked down if you miss uh, a full stop or you know a bracket or something like that. But getting the basics right is really important. So the order that you put it in, uh, make sure that you uh, put in italic the title of the document that you've got it from. So the title of the publication, whether that's the journal name or whether that's the title of the book that needs to be in italics, because that means I know where to find that particular reference. Um, and then uh, the flow of your work, you need to make sure that your work flows nicely. It fits in with that structure as well. To make sure that you link your paragraphs up nicely, that everything makes sense. And then finally, uh, the mark scheme. We use these uh, mark schemes all over the university. You get those before the assignment. Just go through them and make sure that you've checked those. So actually, proofreading is a lot of work. Let's not hide away from it. It's not something you do in a couple of days. Um, using a variety of sources then, we have so many different sources uh, available to you as a library, as a university. And it is really important that you pick on the right ones. So we've talked today uh, about the uh, website data that you could get, for example. If you are only using the web as a source, you're very likely not going to get good grades because all that you're demonstrating is that you've been Googling, you've not been reading the stuff that you were supposed to read. A lot of the time you will have a reading list. There's a lot of material on there that you want to read. Those are usually really good sources to uh, pick up on. Um, you need to use different source types, so try and mix up, and it depends a bit on the paper that you're writing, but try and mix up journal articles with textbooks, with encyclopedias. You know, different types of sources are really useful most of the time. And uh, read widely. Uh, we've talked about this a million times already, but the more you read, the better your work becomes and the better the answers you give will be. Uh, sometimes you will notice that you actually haven't got all the information that you need. So do do some more research into the area that you're looking into and try and enhance your reference list as well. But if you find that you've only used three journal articles and you were supposed to use 10, you will need to find more information. One really good way of doing that, by the way, is sort of reverse reading. If you find a really good current journal article, look at the references that are in that journal article and try and find out what else there is there that you might be able to use for your article. It's usually a really good way of finding better journals and better articles um, going back a bit in time. Then, of course, you can always attend our lovely academic librarians clinics. So each of our academic librarians look after a part of or an entire college, and they are specialists in your subject area. They will know exactly which databases you need to use, how you use them best, what sort of information you need for your uh, coursework. So go and attend those. And again, we've talked about earlier, lipcal.derby.ac.uk. If you go there, you will find those clinics there as well. So do use them because they are there for you and to make sure that you get stuff done. So this is a fun one. Uh, I've referred to this before, but my PhD was actually submitted uh, for um, the um, final fiver. Um, with the incorrect reference list, I had two versions, an old one and a new one, and I stupidly, even after I checked all my citations, still attached the old reference list, missing out about, I don't know, too much. Uh, it was picked up immediately 
because I did a PhD in information science and my uh, external supervisor, examiner, was a professor in librarianship. And guess what professors in librarianship do? They check your reference list first. So that was a bit embarrassing, I can tell you. Um, so make sure that you actually uh, check your references and citations. And again, you cite them right to make sure your references are correct. There's a few things that you can do. One thing that I me always and immediately recommend is when you use a citation in your text, add the reference to a reference list straight away. If you have the reference list at the end of your document, make sure you put it in there. If you keep it in your uh, in a different document or in a reference manager or in your inbox in Outlook like I do, add them straight away. Do it straight away. Just don't put off until the end because you're going to get into trouble. The other thing that you will have to do before you actually finish your document and submit your document is go through your document, highlight all your citations and make sure that each one has a reference to go with it. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating for a lecturer when they are marking work that when they see a citation that they don't recognize, they want to find out what it is and then it doesn't appear in the reference list. You won't believe how often that happens and most of the time it's simple user error. That means that you didn't put it in the reference list and it will cost you marks now. Now here's a really good tip um, that again we, we refer to quite a lot and it's so important. We talk about this in the Derby Diamond for example. When you actually know that you have to submit your work, plan backwards as Alex would call it, make sure that you leave time between the time that you finish your writing and the time that you're going to proofread it. Have a weekend of it, you know, make sure that you do something that's completely different than writing the assignment because you will have fresh eyes. When you have fresh eyes, you will actually see the mistakes that you didn't see before. If you've been writing on a document for days and days and days, you will simply miss things simply because, you know, you've been going over it so often, you don't pick up on it anymore. So fresh eyes are really important. Having said that, also remember that the first drafts are not perfect. You'll see some numbers here, by the way, that's because I nicked these slides from a presentation that Alex did. Uh, but the first drafts are never perfect. You don't need them to be perfect because you're going to proofread them. So don't worry too much about your first draft not being flowing, not actually having a sensible structure. It's a bit of a problem, you know, you do need to make sure you try your best in that first draft. We don't need to worry about it being perfect because when you go into that proofreading mode, that's when you make those fixes and that's where you will actually get a better piece of work at the end of it. And it depends on your way of working as well, but I recommend that you plan at least two proofreading sessions. So when you actually do your first draft, you leave some time, proofread, rewrite, then leave some time, proofread, rewrite, and then that's the one that you would submit. Um, and that just helps again with picking up on the things that you didn't know that were wrong. We talked about this with, uh, well, Naomi talked about this whilst I was muted. Um, homophones and malapromism, mal, 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 malapromism, malapromisms. Um, spell checkers don't always save the world. They really don't. Um, one of the things, for example, that um, always frustrates me is that a lot of people have their spell checker, checker defaulted onto US English and all of a sudden organizations uh, get a Z uh, or a Z as we call it in civilized uh, Europe. And basically that really frustrates me because the spell check says, oh, it needs to be a Z. It doesn't. In English, it's with an S. Stick to the S. Don't make it into a Z. Um, so don't rely too much on spell checkers. Also, sometimes I've noticed spell checks are quite keen on fixing your grammar and actually by doing so, by proposing something different, they destroy the structure of the sentence. So again, don't rely on that too much. The final thing I will say about spell checkers, very popular these days, is Grammarly. Um, let's just say that their algorithms aren't perfect, even though they think they are. Uh, it's a nice business model. They make quite a lot of money. But again, don't over rely on it. It's not perfect at all. Uh, the last time I used it anyway, they might have developed a bit since then. Uh, this episode of the live stream is not sponsored by Grammarly. 
And then finally, uh, some further resources that you might want to look into. So we've got skills guides. I've shown you how to get to them, the libguides.dive.ac.uk. We've got this YouTube channel and we've got Naomi, a new, new uh, URL to the YouTube channel. Did you pick up on that? Yes, I was, well, uh, tremendously excited, obviously. I just have to say, uh, just for, just on Alex's behalf, he's just saying there's a deliberate error on his slide. If anyone, in case anyone thinks that it's an, an actual error on his slide, it's a deliberate error because he's using it to point out that spell Did I miss it? Pick up things. Um, I missed it then, didn't I? I don't know. Hmm. But anyway, if anyone in watching saw the error in Alex's slide, just let it be known that it's a deliberate error. Right. YouTube. Yes. Lovely, lovely link, which is brilliant because the last link was all very long and it didn't was. make any sense. But this so link is got, short and yes. does make sense. Now we've got youtube.com slash C slash Darby Uni Library with capital D U L. That's easy. I can remember that. I'm really pleased it's, with that. Yes. What does the C stand for? Uh, custom. Or referral. Yeah. yeah, I think. Awesome. I'm just guessing. But it's basically like, you know, a bit.ly URL uh, that links directly to our uh, YouTube uh, uh, YouTube channel, which is great. I'm really happy with that. So, yes, um, YouTube, a really good source because, you know, we're here and that's why it's good. Uh, we have all our podcasts. We have our uh, social media as well. Podcasts, you can search on any of your podcast uh, engines that you like. So whether it's Google Podcasts or Apple uh, Music or whether it's uh, Spotify, search for uh, Derby Skills Podcast and you can get it there. Um, I think you can also find it with Derby Uni Library. And then Instagram, Twitter to stay up to date with the latest news. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And then finally, our LibCal calendar. You could type out the long version that we've got here. You can also just type in libcal.dabby.ac.uk and that will get you into our calendar of events. Ooh. That was a good summary, Tim. Well it done. was, wasn't it? I was trying. It was. I, I was compensating for all my failures <laughs> earlier on. Oh. Anyway, um, I think that is sort of the end of the live stream. We were worried we wouldn't have enough content today. My word, were we wrong? Huh? <laughs> I we never get get to a point where none of us has got anything to say. No, I don't think we, we could talk. We, we could genuinely talk point. for three hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've had fun though. Despite I'm I'm going to listen back to this straight away. I want to find out how bad the error was. I'm so guilty. <laughs> I need an indicator, like a live green and red sort of light that goes on and off when I'm on air or not on air. That's the next thing that you can order for your studio, Tim. <laughs> yeah, don't tell my wife. She's a bit upset <laughs> with uh, the amount of money it's cost so far. Um, right, so um, f we haven't got any questions in the chat. We are going to leave it here. We will be back next week. Oh, that's something we need to talk about. I completely forgot. Next week, what are we doing, Naomi? Is that when we're doing our behind the scenes? Yes, we're going to talk about uh, the Behind year 2020, the yes. So, you know, this has been a weird year for everybody, including the library. And we're going to have a look at what we've done and what we've achieved and, and celebrate some wonderful people in the library who are helping out with a lot of stuff. So that should be really good fun. Um, and then the week after... Christmas! Oh, I wish you a Merry Christmas. <gasps> I need to do a background with... Uh, baubles then yeah can we have no singing on what the christmas mean? live stream oh well honestly... apart from anything youtube will put adverts on it if we start singing songs is that not how it works we are sponsored so we don't need adverts <laughs> no but i mean youtube doesn't it automatically detect when you've used someone else's song and put oh it, no, without they, your knowledge now they put a copyright claim on if you do get adverts yeah no we won't get into trouble we're fine um, oh, no. it's alright I've got two weeks everybody listening to work out another reason why Tim shouldn't sing in the live stream we wish no where was that mute button I how can't... is it that you weren't muted for that but you I'm were never... muted earlier I'm never using that again it's evil right. right do you think we should end our stream I think we should I'm going to transition to the like and subscribe unexpected Naomi now well that went excellent didn't it Naomi <clears throat> no? Yes. Yes. Of course it did. I well, can never tell whether people can still hear me or not. Yeah, they can hear you now. 
awesome. Yeah, it's just that you know we make mistakes. We learn every day, though. That's oh, all absolutely. Good. Oh, I forgot. Absolutely. We need to wave. I'm going back to the camera. Wave. Bye. Love you. See you uh, next week. Bye.